ahead and record. We're on the check your understanding. It says Mars Incorporated says that the mix of colors in M&M's milk chocolate candies is 24% blue, 20% orange, 16% green, and 14% yellow, 13% red, and 13% brown. Assume that the company's claim is true. We want to examine the proportion of orange M&M's in the repeated random samples of 50 candies. So it says graph the population distribution, identify the individuals, the variable, and the parameters of interest. So I'm going to go down to the bottom and I'm going to do that. Make sure when you guys are doing your homework and I've graded all your homework except for if you turned it in late. Okay, so if you turned it in late, I do not have it graded and I will grade it as soon as I get two seconds to breathe and grade it. Um, I made some comments if you got less than 100 so that you know what you missed. I printed them all off, graded them by hand and then put your grades in so that way you guys could see what you're missing. Uh, the biggest thing is watch what uh, symbols that you use. I didn't really count off for those, but make sure like you're using P or P hat. Those are two different things. So make sure that you use them the right way or mu and X bar. Okay, so watch that. So graph the proportion distribution. I'm not going to graph that. We're just going to go ahead because you guys know how to graph. And we're going to identify the individuals. So what are the individuals? Yeah, the candies or the M&Ms. A quick question. Yes. If we got one out of one, does that just mean we didn't get anything wrong? You got a hundred, yep. Mm -hmm. If you got anything else that have been like a 0.5 or a 0.75, those are the only things that I got other than that. Thank you. 75, yep. All right, so then what is your variable? What changes in this problem? Not the amount, but the color. That's what they're separating them by. And then what is your parameter of interest? What are you looking for? We want to examine what? What's it say? Proportion of orange. Okay, so you guys on your homework, when you wrote your parameter out on number two, A and B, you guys wrote, some of you just wrote unemployment. Remember, a parameter has to be a proportion, okay? So we always need to say a proportion or a percent of unemployment. So make sure you put that in there as well. And I did make that comment, but I did not take off for that, okay? So make sure when you're doing it from now on, you put proportion or percent. All right, number two. That's it, that's the last one. Number two, we're gonna go back up here. Imagine taking an SRS of 50 M&Ms, make a graph showing a possible distribution of the sample data, give the value of the appropriate statistic for the sample. I don't have, you don't have to do a graph of 50 M&Ms. So what's your sample? What were we looking at? What, what proportion? Yeah, the orange, it gives us that. What is that proportion of orange? Read the top. Yes. Guys, it just wants you to keep making graphs of this sample data. What are, we're not making graphs. Y'all know how to do that, so I'm not going to waste your time showing you how to make a graph. How do you know when to put the p hat? So this one is a statistic, so it's going to be p hat. Okay, and it's like ask for a statistic. Uh -huh. Well, see, yes, watch your parameters because they're one or the other. Okay, so just watch this. All right, which of the graphs that follow could be the appropriate sampling distribution of the statistic and explain your choice? Explain your choice. So we want the sampling distribution. So if we go back, you guys remember seeing this. This one is population. Remember, it showed all the colors at each percentage. Okay, all the colors. So we had red and blue at 50%. Then we took SRSs of 20 and those kind of changed a little bit. And then this one showed every single sample that we took graphed together. Okay, so what would this one be? Would this be a sampling distribution? Would 
Let's look again. The population distribution shows all of the colors. We said red and blue. This one is population because it shows all the colors, every single color. What is the color that we're looking for in our sample? Orange. Just orange. So we don't care about all the colors. So this one is actually population. Distribution. Because it shows all colors. All we care about in ours is orange. So it's not going to be this one. So now we should see all these little dots, but what did it tell us about our oranges? It should be what? What should our statistic be? 20%. So look at these two graphs and which one shows it at 20%. Mm -hmm. So if we look, our peaks are at 0.20. On this one, it's more at 0.40 or 0.35. So it has to be the one with 0.20. Everybody understand? Know the difference between a population and a sample graph, okay? Know the difference between the two. All right. So you'll probably have to do that in your homework tonight. Just be ready for that. Pick it out. The fact that statistics from random samples have definite, or sorry, definite sampling distribution allows us to answer the question, how trustworthy is a statistic as an estimate of a parameter? To get a complete answer, we consider the shape, center, and spread of the sampling distribution. I gotta turn this, I cannot write straight up and down. So then we're gonna break them down. The center, biased and unbiased estimators. We've already talked about bias and unbiased, right? So it's coming back. I told you everything's going to be coming back. Let's return to the familiar chips example. How well does the sample proportion of red chips estimate the population proportion of red chips? I remember that was 0.5. The dot plot below shows the approximate sampling distribution of P hat once again. So we've already seen this graph. It's just repeating it for you. We noted earlier that the center of this distribution is very close to 0.5, which is the parameter value. In fact, if we took all possible samples of 20 chips from the population, calculated P hat for each sample, and then found the mean of all those P values we get exactly 0.5. Okay, so just to tell you, because I feel like I read this and you guys don't typically understand what I'm reading, okay? So what it says, if we took all possible samples of 20, so maybe we flipped 20 coins. So we could have 20 heads. We could have one head and 19 tails. We could have one tail, one head, and... 18 tails again. You see what I'm saying? So that's your that's your sample. So all of those are specific samples. So like if we were pulling chips and we pulled blue, 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 red, blue, blue, red, blue, that's one sample. So if we could take all of those possibilities and plot them and average them, we would get 0.5. So that's what it's saying. But there's like so many that we would never do that. So we try to do a large number to reduce that variability. So remember back in the day, we talked about that, how having larger sample sizes and more samples calls us to reduce that variability. So that's why they did 500 SRSs, okay? So for this reason, we say that P hat is an unbiased estimator of P. So if we take many samples, that's what I just talked about. One or two samples may not get you close to 50%, but the 500 that we took yesterday or whatever, that will get you close to 50%. If we take many samples, the value of an unbiased estimator will sometimes exceed 
the value of the parameter and sometimes be less. However, because the sampling distribution of the statistic is centered at the true value, we will not consistently overestimate or underestimate the parameter. This is consistent with our definition of bias from chapter four. So yesterday when the teacher said that they could get 85% or they did get 85%, there had to be some kind of bias in that because we knew it was way too far from the actual statistic. Okay. We will confirm later that the sample proportion P hat is an unbiased estimator of the population proportion P. This is a very helpful result if we're dealing with a categorical variable. What is a categorical variable? You can't find the average, so our colors, red, blue, green, those are all categorical, colors are categorical. With quantitative, so actual numbers, variables, we might be interested in estimating the population mean the median the minimum the maximum, the Q1, the Q3, the variance, the standard deviation, all of those things we've already done, the IQI and the range. Which if any of these are unbiased estimators? So we're going to talk about that. All right, Ms. Washington's class did an activity with heights. Each student wrote his or her height in inches on a small piece of paper and placed it in a bag. The teacher mixed the bag thoroughly and each student took a sample of four pieces of paper. The student recorded the data and replaced the papers back into the bag. They calculated the sample mean and the sample range of heights. Then they recorded the four heights in the sample, the sample mean, and the sample range like the chart below. The data was then plotted and everyone found the population mean and the population range. The following graphs were produced. They were then able to tell which was biased and which was unbiased. Okay. It's very good so far. Y'all know the process that they did. All right, so one more time. She put all their heights in a bag they took a sample of four, they wrote down the four, found the mean and found the range, okay? The data was plotted, there's all the plots. And then they were able to tell which ones are biased and unbiased. This one, cause you can't see it, is X bar or the sample mean. It says it right here, it's really tiny. And this one is the range. So her students concluded that the sample mean X bar is probably an unbiased estimator of the population mean, mu. And here's their reasoning. Okay. The center of the approximate sample distribution of X bar
equals, and we're gonna just test it right here. It says that the center of the mean is 65.67. So this is where I'm getting this number. Sorry, 65.6. And the population mean or mu was 66.07. All right, so let me go back. Their sample means, all of their samples that they took, they plotted and it peaks around 65.6, okay? They took all the heights in the class and averaged them together. That's your population mean and it averaged 66.07. These are really close. Okay, so that's all it's saying. So this is the actual population mean. So every student in class averaged together. This one is the samples averaged together. They also concluded that the sample range is a bias estimator. And here's why. The sample, uh, the center of the sampling range, that's hanging out right here, is 10.12. But the center of the parameter was 21. Why do you think that's the case? Why is it such a big huge deal. What does range have to deal with? So longest and smallest. Right. So in your, just like we talked about with all the other things that are affected by everything else. So in your bag, you might be lucky to pull out the tallest and the shortest, but you're not going to do that every single time. So in the population, when we pull out the tallest and the shortest, it's going to be a very wide range compared to your samples when you're only pulling out four of the class members. Okay. Okay, so what happens in this sample, the range was 13. In another sample, the range might be 12. In another, it might be two. Then you average those numbers together. So that's what this is. So that's why it's a lot smaller. Okay, okay. so this is a large enough difference. To show bias. Again, why do we use the center as the, um, the mean and the standard deviation as our spread? It's because it's more unbiased than the range and the median. Okay. So we're going to flip our page. To confirm the class's conclusions, we used Fathom software to simulate taking 250 SRSs of n equals four students. So we just did a simulation in software so that we, we could just have it again. For each sample, we plotted the mean height, which was X bar and the range of the heights. And here are the graphs. So you can see that these are pretty peaked at 66.07 and these are really spread out. So it looks like the class was right. X bar is unbiased. And sample range is bias. Is it always going to be like that? Yes. All right. So when we calculate the sample variance, we're dividing by n minus one, and we've already done this before. This is not a new formula that we've seen. We're just throwing it out there to you. In chapter one, we introduced the sample variance, which was the sample was S of X, which was your data and then squared because it's variance is squared. As a measure of spread for a set of quantitative data,
the idea of variance, and I just use the symbol, uh, the symbol, sorry, is simple. It's a number that describes the average squared deviation. from their mean, which is X bar. And remember X bar deals with samples. So that's why we're gonna keep seeing X bars because we're talking about the sample. So S for sample squared because it's variance. And then here X bar is because it's the mean of the sample. It probably surprised you that it should say when we computed, I thought I fixed that, but I guess I didn't. This average by dividing by N minus one. Again, we've already talked about this instead of dividing by n. We said we'd talk about it later. Here's why. So now we're ready to tell you why we defined the sample variation as one over n minus one times the sum of the observation minus the mean squared. That formula is on your formula sheet. I don't think that I've copied your formula sheet over to this semester, so I need to do that at some time. Also need to give you guys your 7-3 notes. Do not let me forget before we walk out of here. Okay, you'll we'll have to have them. In an inference setting involving a quantitative variable, we might be interested in estimating the variance. And I left a space there for a reason of population distribution. So just to remind you, the population variance looks like that. So sample has an S population, has the little O. Is the negative like a standard No, no. The nice logical choice for our estimator. is the sample variance. And again, that's just that symbol for sample variance. We used Fathom software to take 500 SRS, SRSs of N equals four from the population distribution of heights in Ms. Washington's class. Uh, should say note, I am going to fix these. But the population variance is, they give you this. This is not anything that I just wrote down. So once they did that in the Fathom software, they got the population uh, variance was 22.19. For each sample, we recorded the value of two statistics. So you guys have a var on your calculator. And then you have a var on your calculator and you'll see it soon. Oh, sorry, this should be squared. Your var is your sample variance, which is that formula that I just gave you. Again, this is the sample variance. This one uses just N and does the same thing. So we'll talk about those two formulas in a minute. All right, so what it's doing is trying to show you why we use N minus one and not N. So it says the figure shows the approximate sampling distributions for these two statistics. We use histograms. So what they did, one more time, let me, let me go back over this. They used both of these formulas for the same data. Okay, so that's all it's saying. I did the first formula and then I recalculated it using the second formula. So variance using the first formula, variance using the second formula. To show the overall pattern, more clearly, the vertical lines mark the means of the two distributions. Okay, remember that we're looking for 22.19. Okay, so again, what we're looking for is that 22.19. This one is the VAR, so that was the one, N minus one, 
This one was barn, which was one minus n. And if we look at the vertical lines, this is our sample variance. And that is real close to 22.19. This one is below 20, so it is not close to 22.19. So we want to get as close as possible, so we're going to use the 1 over n minus 1. That's all that that's trying to tell you. Why? Because it does this. It gets us a lot closer. So we can see that VARN is a biased estimator because it keeps us far away from the actual. The mean of its sampling distribution, excuse me, distribution is clearly less than the value of the population parameter 22.19. However, the statistic VAR, otherwise known as the sample variance, and again, that's just the sample, is an unbiased estimator. its values are centered at 22.19. That's why we divide by n minus one and not n when calculating the sample variance. To get an unbiased estimator of the population variance. So now we're going to talk about the spread. Low variability is better, and we already knew that. To get a trustworthy estimate of an unknown population parameter, start by using a statistic. Statistic, that's an unbiased estimator. This ensures that you won't consistently over or underestimate. And we don't want to overestimate or underestimate the parameter that we're looking for. Unfortunately, using an unbiased estimator doesn't guarantee that the value of your statistic will be close to the actual parameter value. The following example illustrates what we mean. Who watches Survivor? Why sample size matters. Television executives and companies who advertise on TV are interested in how many viewers watch particular shows. According to the Nielsen rating, Survivor was one of the most watched television shows in the U.S. during every week that it aired. Suppose that the true proportion of U.S. adults who have watched Survivor is P equals 0.37. The top dot plot shows the results of drawing 400 SRSs, so 400 samples of size 100 from a population with a proportion or the parameter being 37. We see that a sample of 100 people often gave a P hat quite far from the population parameter. All right, so here's the 100. We're looking for 37, which is about right here. And you can see that there's a lot. There's a lot off of there, okay? So that's why the Gallup poll asked not 100, but 1,000 people whether they had watched Survivor. Let's repeat our simulation this time, taking 400 SRSs, so still 400 samples, but this time we're doing 1,000. From the population with a proportion of 0.37 who have watched Survivor. 
the bottom dot plot displays the distribution of the 400 values of p hat from these new samples. So look at the difference in the variability. We went from here to here with only 100. So we only took, like our drawing our chips out or whatever, we only took out 100 chips. So this is what happened. When we did the same thing, but we took out 1,000, it shortened it up and made it a little bit taller, which makes our center more known, okay? So remember what we said, more like to reduce the uh, variability, increase the sample size. So instead of 100, we did 1,000, all right? So we can see that the spread of the top dot plot is much greater than the spread of the bottom. With samples of size 100, the values of p hat vary from 0.25 to 0.54. The standard deviation of these p hat values is about 0.05. So then when we increase our SRS size to 1000, the values of p hat only vary from 0.328 to 0.412. So again, it's skinnied it up. It's not a wide range. The standard deviation of these p hat values is about 0.015. So most random samples of 1,000 people give a p hat that's within 0.03 of the actual population parameter, which was 0.37. So again, it reduced the variability. What are we trying to get out of here? Increase sample size, reduce variability. Increase sample size, reduce variability. Okay. The sample proportion p hat from a random sample of any size is an unbiased estimator of the parameter p. As we can see from the previous example though, larger random samples have a clear advantage. They are much more likely to produce, it should be an estimate, oh it is good, estimate close to the true value of the parameter. Said another way, larger random samples give us more information than smaller. And I don't know that they give you more information, I would say clearer information than the smaller. That's because a large random sample gives us more information about the underlying population than a smaller sample does. Taking, taking a larger sample doesn't fix bias. Remember that even a very large voluntary response sample or convenient sample is worthless because of bias. So remember voluntary response, why is it bias? Why is it bias? People who respond might be like more inclined to respond if they have a strong opinion. Right, both of you are very correct. And then convenient sample, what about it? Right. It doesn't, it doesn't check the overall population. So for if it's school and we pick the first 30 kids that come in school, they're probably going to be bus riders. So that doesn't get our overall population. All right. So that's where the bias comes in for that. There are general rules for describing how the spread of a sampling distribution of a statistic decreases as the sample size increases. One important and surprising fact is that the variability of a statistic is repeated in repeated sampling does not depend very much on the size of the population. All right, so this chart is important to know or this little definition right here. The variability of a statistic is described by the spread you knew that, how much does it vary? How high to how low? This spread is determined mainly by the size 
of the random sample. So we saw that when it was 100, the variability was huge or the range was huge, the spread was huge. When we made our sample size larger, it decreased that spread or that variability. Larger samples give smaller spreads. That's what I just said. The spread of a sampling distribution does not depend much on the size of the population as long as the population is at least 10 times larger than the sample. Larger samples give smaller spreads. Yes. Why would that be instead of like the other way around? So this right here. We had larger samples, so everything comes shooting towards the middle. When we have a smaller sample size with 100, that variability spreads out because there's so much more to get done. Oh, okay. That's all. And we learned that like a long time ago. That's not anything new at all. We're just going back over it. All right, so why does the size of the population have little influence on the behavior of the statistics from random samples? Imagine sample harvested corn by thrusting a scoop into a very large stack of corn kernels. The scoop doesn't know whether it's surrounded by a bag of corn or by an entire truckload. As long as the corn is well mixed up so that the scoop selects a random sample, the variability of the result only depends on the size of the scoop. Okay. The fact that variability of a statistic is controlled by the size of the sample has important consequences for designing samples. Suppose a researcher wants to estimate the proportion of all US adults who use Twitter regularly, a random sample of 1,000 or 1,500 people will give a fairly precise estimate. of the parameter because the sampling size is large. Now consider another researcher who wants to estimate the proportion of Ohio State, all Ohio State University students who use Twitter regularly. It can take just as large an SRS to estimate the proportion of Ohio State University students who use Twitter regularly as to estimate with equal precision the proportion of all US adults who use Twitter regularly. So they're trying to compare like all US adults to just like this college. So your population being all US adults makes it a larger population than just using Ohio State. So that's all it's doing is trying to get you the difference in the population, okay? We can expect to need a smaller SRS at Ohio State just because there are about 60,000 Ohio State students and about 235 million adults. All right, so again, what it's saying is take an SRS like N equals 100 of this population is still gonna give you pretty much the same thing of N equals 100 from this population, okay? Doesn't matter what the size of the population is, it matters what the size of the sample is. All right, just a couple more, y'all. I know you're tired, I know you're bored. Just a couple more. So on this one, check your understanding. The histogram above left shows the intervals and minutes between eruptions of the Old Faithful Geyser for all 222 recorded eruptions during a particular month. For this population, the median is 75 minutes. We use Fathom software to take 500 SRSs of size 10 from the population. The 500 should say values of the sample median are displayed in the histogram above right. The mean of these 500 values is 73.5, okay? So one more time. For the first one, the median is 75. And again, it's 222 recorded eruptions. Then we decided to take 500 SRSs of size 10 from the population. And they gave us the mean of 73.5. Is the sample median an unbiased estimator of the population median? And justify your answer. Okay. Sample median. 
Which one is the sample median? 73.5. And then which one is the population? 75. 75, okay. So is the sample median an unbiased estimator of the population median? Yes or no? Remember, excuse me, unbiased means they're fairly similar. They're right there next to each other. Unbiased means they're farther apart. So what do you think? Yes or no? Think about what we had before. If it's going to be pretty close, it's going to be like right there at it. You're going to have like tenths or something like that. This one is, this one's from 75 to 73. So that's, that's fairly distant, if that makes sense. Which one would not be unbiased is going to be the mean. If it actually gave you like the mean and then the mean of the other one. So medians are typically always biased. Okay. So this one is no, it's not unbiased. because 73.5 does not equal 75. Now, if it were like 75.1 or 74.9, then we would say, yes, it's fine, okay? Number two, suppose we had taken samples of size 20 instead of size 10. So we're increasing the sample size, okay? Would the spread of the sampling distribution be larger, smaller, or about the same? Oh. Good. We increase the sample. So spread would be smaller. I can't spread. The third one said describe the shape of the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is the one on the right. What is it? The right, that's this one. Left skewed. Okay. Anything else? You know, mm -hmm. That's it, guys. Good job. Here we go. Two more pages, promise them. This one doesn't take long. Bias variability and shape. We can think of the true value of the population parameter as a bullseye on a target and the sample statistic as an arrow fired at the target. Both bias and variability. Describe what happens when we take, should say, many shots, not man shots, at the target. Bias means that our aim is off and we consistently miss the bullseye in the same direction. Our sample values do not center on the population value. High variability means that repeated shots are widely scattered on the target. Repeated sample do not give very similar results. Notice that low variability. Shots that are close together can accompany high bias. That means they're far from the target, okay? Bias is far from the center. Variability is far from each other, okay? So low or no bias, shot center on the bullseye, can accompany high variability shots that are widely scattered. Ideally, we'd like our estimates to be accurate, which would be unbiased and precise, which is low variability. Okay, so we'll look at these targets real fast. High bias 
is going to be far from the center. How far it is from the center. Low variability are your shots close together. So you're consistent. You're consistently bad, but you're consistent. So low bias is these shots are pretty close to the center, but high variability means they're scattered around. Okay, They're not close to each other. High bias means that they're far from the center. High variability means they're scattered about. What we want is no bias and low variability. So no bias would be close to the center. Low, vari low variability, sorry, y'all, would be close together. Okay, so that's what these are trying to get you to understand. The following example attempts to tie these ideas together. Very little writing on this and very little writing on the next page. And we're done. This is mainly reading. <clears throat> Um, let's skip this. We don't need it. And let's just go to the back page. The lesson about center and spread is clear. This is just summing up what we've learned. Given a choice of statistics to estimate an unknown parameter, choose one with no or low bias and minimum, minimum variability. Shape is a more complicated issue. We have seen sampling distributions that are less skewed. Right skewed. Roughly symmetric. and even approximately normal. The same statistic can have sampling distributions with different shapes depending on the population distribution and the sample size. Our advice, be sure to consider the shape of the sampling distribution before doing inference. So what you'll learn, that's kind of a, a foreshadowing there is that we're gonna to try to make our shape normal before we do any kind of inference because everything works out as normal, okay? All right, that is 7.1. If you guys have that, make sure that you finish that up by midnight tonight. And then you will have Albert tomorrow. Everybody has signed up for Albert. It will show up tonight. Well, it should be there today. I think I, I opened it today. So if you wanna start on that as well, that's fine. But this homework has to be done by midnight. Huh? Uh, there's one that's a review quiz and there's one that's 7.1. Yes. Yes. It is not very easy at all. It is not. Okay. So hang on, everybody that's on there. <clears throat>